Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts those from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message of God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout the promise of Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of those being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Okay, question for you. Do you have a favorite character in the Bible? Now I know that many of you are thinking, I do, and it's Jesus. That's kind of cheating. Um, Obviously, Jesus is our favorite character in the Bible, but outside of that, do you have particular characters uh, that are favorites of yours. I have, I have to say, tell you two or three. Those who have heard me preach know that I have a great deal of affection for Peter. Um, I like David a lot too. And quite frankly, I really like Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. Um, Jethro doesn't show up very much, but um, he's a really cool father-in-law for Moses. But one of my favorite characters in the Bible is us. It's us. It's you and me. It's the church. Now you may um, not know that you're one of the characters uh, in the Bible, but you are. Um, Jesus actually uh, refers to us uh, two or three times. He mentions us in Matthew 28. He um, prays for us specifically uh, in John 17, and he names us um, in uh, Matthew chapter 16. But Peter, who's the person who he's talking to in that passage uh, in Matthew 16, Peter also mentions us, and he mentions us in the wonderful sermon that he delivers to Cornelius's household in that passage that Julie just read for us. It's some um, part of the overall story of Peter and Cornelius, which is a wonderful story. Um, Those of you who were here last week uh, will know that I preached last week's sermon on kind of the first half of this story. Uh, You'll also remember that I assigned you homework, which was to read the entirety of the story of Peter and Cornelius in um, Acts 10. Show of hands, please. How many of you did your homework? Okay, only a few hands. I offer that by way of encouragement to those of you who weren't here last week. These guys didn't do their homework, so it's not going to take you long to catch up with them. Um, If you were here, um, uh, then uh, you're familiar with the story, but I'll just bring everybody up to speed really quickly. The story here is that there's a Roman officer named Cornelius, a centurion, and he has a vision from God. He's a godly man, and he has a vision from God in which God says to him, Send some of your servants to go fetch this guy named Peter. He's going to come and tell you some important stuff. And meanwhile, Peter himself receives a vision, um, which kind of ties in with this. So when these guys show up at the house where he's staying and say, come with us, 
to the home of this Roman centurion, he goes, even though that's a kind of a, 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 a really challenging thing for him to do as a Jew, because the Jews in his day were not supposed to go into the homes of Gentiles, let alone of Roman soldiers. But he goes to Cornelius' house, and some amazing stuff happens. And last week we talked about that part of the story, and there were kind of five quick lessons um, that came out of that, lessons about us as the church. Uh, And they were, just to bring everybody up to speed, number one, that as the church we are called by God to go. Secondly, that we need to pray as the church, as Christ followers, in order to know where it is that God is sending us. That we needn't fear that God is sending us somewhere strange because wherever he's telling us to go, he's already there ahead of us. Number four, and perhaps most importantly in terms of the story we listened to last week, there's a very real possibility that the place that God tells us that he wants us to go is some place that's going to be uncomfortable uh, to us or seem like an unreasonable place for him to send us. And the fifth and, of course, most important lesson is, but regardless of that, we need to follow the example of Christ and of his disciples, and we need to go. Now, there's last week's sermon um, all uh, summed up for you, so you don't necessarily need to go online um, and listen to the audio recording of it, although Rosemary is very appreciative when I do a plug for the audio recordings, so you can do that. I kind of uh, did something mean to you last week, though, because where we cut off in the story of Peter and Cornelius was at the point where Peter arrives at Cornelius' house and says, wow, this is kind of amazing. I'm here preaching to a bunch of Gentiles, and I stopped just before his sermon. And this week, I want to remedy that by talking about that amazing sermon that he preaches. Um, Uh, Those of you, and there are a few of you who do some preaching, um, will share my awe that uh, in this passage, uh, Peter preaches a sermon which is just a little over 200 words in length, about the length of my average sentence. And, And in that 200 word sermon, he captures the entirety of the gospel. He covers all the key events in Christ's life from his baptism by John the Baptist through to his death and resurrection. And not only that, but he adds two, includes two really important bookends to the gospel message. It's not just that these amazing events happened, but he mentions that they were events which were foretold, that scripture said these things were going to happen, And the second bookend is that these things not only happened, but there were witnesses who saw that they happened. And that's a really critical part of the gospel message. Because without witnesses, there is no gospel. Without witnesses, there's no gospel. The gospel, as we know, means the good news. Well, there's no news if there's no one to tell it. So the apostles were witnesses to who Christ was and what he had done. But this raises a bit of a challenge for us. Right? Who are these witnesses to the gospel? The phrase that um, Peter uses in Acts 10 is he said, God revealed these things, showed these things to us, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He didn't uh, show what was going on with Jesus to everyone, but he showed it, he chose as witnesses, those who ate and drank with Jesus after he rose from the dead. Now this interesting way of describing it has, I think, two meanings. It has a very literal meaning, because... We know from the Gospels that after Christ rose from the dead, he showed up to people. People got to actually see him and talk to him and interact with him on nine different occasions. And the Apostle Paul, in one of his letters, refers to two other incidents when people got to witness 
the risen Christ. Now, most of those appearances were to the 11 disciples. On three of those occasions, the Gospels tell us, and this is really critical, on three of those occasions, the risen Lord, Jesus, ate with his disciples. He ate and drank with them. And this is a really important detail because it's possible um, that if uh, Jesus uh, was crucified and then the, the apostles saw him and later told people about it, people might say, well, that was probably a ghost. But it's very particular in the Gospels that he, they, he eats and drinks with them. He is a living, enfleshed Lord. And so that's the literal meaning But I think there is also a very specific uh, second layer of meaning to this. I mean, one of the challenges is, if the whole deal on this was, these things happened to Jesus and the apostles were there to experience it and witness it, so they can tell other people, within a a few decades, all the apostles had died off. They certainly have passed away by now, 2,000 years later. So who does the witnessing now? Who are the witnesses now? Who bears witness to the truth about Christ and his death and resurrection now? Well, around the time that the apostles were starting to pass away, to die off, there was another very well-established practice in the church. And it was the practice of the Lord's Supper. By very early on, we know from the scriptures, the church when they met, gathered together as the body of Christ, would celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And from the very beginning, it was the belief of the church, of Christ's followers, that when they ate the bread and drank the wine in memory of him, that he was with them in a very real way. The Lord's Supper represented his physical presence with them. And in fact, in the ensuing couple of centuries, um, there were two, what much of the church calls sacraments, um, that the church practiced. We have baptism, and we have the Lord's Supper. And those two sacraments came to be understood as the sacraments that essentially define who the church is. Much of the church, for much of its history, has has defined the church as those who've been baptized. Baptists certainly do that. And much of the church, over those 2,000 years, has defined itself. The answer to who's the church is, ah, the church is those people who gather around this table. The people who participate in communion. The people who, to this day, eat and drink with Christ after He's raised from the dead. We are those people. We are people who eat and drink with Christ after he's raised from the dead. And so when Peter in this sermon to Cornelius and his household says, the witnesses to Christ are those who have eaten and drunk with him since he arose, there's a level of meaning in which that means it's us. We're the witnesses. Now, Peter's sermon reveals, I think, three really important truths for us to understand about the nature of the church. The first is that God chose you. God chose you and me for the church. The second is, bad news, God didn't choose you because of who you are. He didn't choose us because of our qualifications. And the third is that God did choose us for a very specific purpose. And that purpose is to be those witnesses, is to bear witness to him. So, first point. God chose you. You'll notice that in this passage in Acts, Peter says, God didn't reveal Jesus to everyone. He chose specific people to refer uh, or to, to reveal Christ to. Right? And this raises for us a big theological question, which is why didn't he choose to reveal himself 
to everyone. And I have to tell you, this, this is tricky theological territory for us Baptists. Those of you who were here at the end of January, when Todd came to um, uh, preach uh, for us and to meet us so we could decide whether God was calling us to call him as, as pastor, uh, Ken Faggeter, bless his heart, stood up during the question and answer session and said, essentially, Todd, are you an Armenian or a Calvinist? Now, um, those are terms that most people won't be familiar with. Suffice to say that throughout the history of the Baptist tradition, about 400 years, there have been kind of two groups of people who have struggled to understand this idea that God chooses us. Because certainly there's a way of understanding in the gospel that says God is sovereign, God decides who he calls and who he doesn't, but we also have an understanding of the gospel which makes very clear that the choice to follow Christ or not follow Christ is put in front of each of us and each of us must respond. And there's always been a kind of a tension theologically about, well, which of those is it? How can it kind of be both? Um, I don't today intend to resolve the broad theological issues of the last 400 years, but I will say this, that on a personal level, here's the important message. You were called by God, and it was God who placed the call. You know, sometimes you're in a phone conversation with somebody, and the phone conversation goes on for a bit, and you forget who called who. That needn't happen in the case of this call. We were called by God. God placed the call to us. It's not an accident that you're here. It's not an accident that we're here, but let me say this to you on the most personal level. Whoever you are individually, it is not an accident that you are here. God called you to him. He called you to this church this morning. Okay. We'll say that God calls some people, doesn't call other people. The next question is, how does he choose who to call? What's the basis, right? Why is God more likely to choose some people over other people? Now, um, there is, running out throughout the Bible, this theme of the idea of God's chosen people. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel were God's chosen people. So, it was largely your ethnic citizenship as a Jew as a Hebrew, as a a member of the nation of Israel, that categorized you as somebody that God had chosen. But in this really critical passage, where God comes to Peter and says, all that stuff about it just being for the Jews, that's all gone now. Um, That's all broken down. And when Peter shows up at Cornelius' house and and talks to Cornelius a bit and gets this sort of sense of, this is real, I've been called here to witness to these people who aren't Jews. Peter says, now I know that God shows no favoritism. God isn't choosing who is going to, he's going to reveal himself to on the basis of their merits. And I have to say, the fact that those who God calls to testify to him, to witness to him, are chosen regardless of their resumes, is pretty obvious throughout the whole history, right? I mean, if you read the Old Testament, the people of Israel are just a miserable choice. They spend much more time disobeying God and running after other gods and building golden idols and doing that stuff. They spend a lot more time doing that than they do actually faithfully obeying God. Another example is the disciples. I mean, the 12 disciples that God chose to be his principal witnesses Time and time again, they are just prove themselves to be almost thick-headed in terms of the things that Christ is teaching them. Time and again, he says to them, look, how many times do I have to say this? There's a passage in the scripture that says, even after he was raised from the dead, there were some of them who doubted what was really going on. The disciples weren't chosen because they were the 12 brightest, sharpest, best religious leaders of their day. Then let us turn our attention to the church in the last 2,000 years. By golly, we've done an awful lot of harm in 2,000 years. We have done an awful lot of misunderstanding and disobeying and abusing 
the privilege that God has given us in 2,000 years, were not a great choice for the people to represent God to the world. But we are God's choice. God chooses us in spite of who we are. God chose me and he chose you in spite of who we are. Not because of who we are. Not because of the great resume that we bring um, that God really needs us on his team. God chose us in spite of who we are. There's a passage in 2 Corinthians um, that uses this wonderful metaphor of jars of clay. Jesus is, or Paul rather, is writing to the church in Corinth where they're having all kinds of trouble. They're having leadership disputes and they're having political struggles and they're having abuse of the way they worship. They're dead, they're dead all the problems a church can have. And Paul writes them this letter and he does some rebuking and admonishing them, but he encourages them too because he says, look, there is this light, this truth of the gospel. It's the most amazing treasure there is. And God has decided to store it in jars of clay. By which he means to say he's given it to you and me to carry. But Paul goes on to say, but that's a good thing. It's a deliberate thing. The reason God has chosen to have his message carried by such poor messengers, by us, is so that it will be very clear that what's going on is happening by God's strength, not by ours. In fact, one of the problems that we tend to have as Christians, one of the problems that the church has, is that whenever we tend to think that what's happening in the church, what's happening in God's kingdom, is happening because we're so good at it, it's happening because of our merits, it's happening because we're wise and strong and, and organized and passionate, whenever we start to think that, we tend to start going off on our own without God, and we start to, I think it's fair to say, bear witness to ourselves, rather than bearing witness to the God who is risen. I think a lot of churches do that. I think our church does that sometimes. There is a narrative here at Kingsway that says, when visitors come in that door, They end up staying because we do such a good job of being warm and friendly and inviting to them. And I think that's true, by and large. But I think it's very important for us as the church to keep in mind that it's not our merit that's causing people to stay when they stay. It's Christ's presence here. It's God at work here. It's the Holy Spirit here moving us to welcome and greet a people warmly that causes people to stay. Okay, recap those two points. We have been chosen by God, and we've been chosen not because of our resumes, not for our merits, not because of who we are. But we have been chosen for a reason, or I should say for a purpose. And the purpose that we've been chosen for is to bear witness to God. We've been chosen to bear witness. Let me uh, read what Acts 10 says at verses 42. 10, this is 42 to 43. He commanded us to preach. Let me I'll go scroll back on that. 39. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on the tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And then it says this, He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. What those witnesses were called for, the reason he's chosen some people to see the risen Christ And be witnesses to him is so that we will then preach him to the whole world. Now this isn't just a message for the twelve apostles to preach, although preach they do. And it isn't just a message for the dozen or so of us in the room who have occasion to stand up behind one of these things and preach 
which is our understanding of the mean. In this context, the call to preach Christ is a call and an assignment and a command for all of us. It's what being a witness to Christ means is to preach this to the world. It's a command for all who have eaten and drunk with him after he was raised from the dead. God has called us to be a witness for him. You know, it's a common theological mistake we've made over the years in the church, and I think we still make. This idea of thinking that the whole point of getting saved is me getting saved. That the reason God saved me, the reason God revealed himself to me, the reason God drew me to him, was so that I'd be saved. And that's not the case. There's an analogy that I heard, and it works wonderfully. Imagine that you're a sports fan, right? And a sports player. You play on a a particular sport, and you get called to go be on a team, right? You get a call that says, I want you, I'll use Dan, because, you know, Dan plays some basketball. So Dan is called by the Raptors and is told, Dan, uh, we we need you to come and play on the Raptors. And Dan shows up on the first day and says, wow, I'm so excited that you're going to give me a set of front row seat tickets for the season. I'm really looking forward to sitting in the front row and watching you guys play. The coach would say, no, no, you're misunderstanding. I haven't given you a free VIP subscription tickets to come and watch the game. I've called you to come and be in the game. And I think sometimes as the church, some of us make the mistake of thinking that when we were called by God, when we came to relationship with Christ, when we were saved, when we were born again, when we grew into our relationship, when we made a decision to be followers of Christ, that meant we now have tickets to watch the work of the kingdom. And that isn't what's happened. We've been called onto the team. We've been called to be in the game. Now, another problem that I think we've fallen into in the church is that we think evangelism, because that's the word that we use for witnessing to other people, you know, through words and deeds, you know, witnessing to other people about who Christ is, spreading that word to everyone. We've tended in the church to think of evangelism as one of the categories of things that a church organizes and does kind of down the list of things. It's one of the things on the church's to-do list, and we, I think we've fallen into a little bit of a tendency to say, well, I'm not responsible for evangelism because I'm not on the evangelism committee this year. You know, I was on the evangelism committee three years ago, and, you know, I organized evangelism stuff, and maybe I'll go on the committee again, but I'm not on the committee this year, so evangelism isn't kind of my thing. I mostly help out setting up chairs. But that's not how it works. This was never built. There's no place in here where it's set up that the idea of being called to be a witness to Christ meant that witnessing to Christ was something you would add on to your faith. That you'd come to church and you'd read the Bible and you'd pray and you'd serve on a committee and you'd enjoy fellowship with other Christians and you'd do some pastoral care for the people around you that you know about and... That's your basic Christianity, but for some people, there's also bearing witness to Christ. That's not found in this book. What the scripture says is that that's the reason God chose you and chose you over people that he hasn't yet chosen. The very reason God called us. Kingsway has a mission statement. We celebrate our faith in God by reaching out creatively to our community, and helping people grow in a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Spiritually searching people grow in a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. The mission of this church isn't in this room. It's out there. Now, I've always been annoyed by pastors who stood up in the pulpit and said, y'all should be evangelizing more because it's a lot easier to stay safe from here 
than, than, than to do practically kind of in the field. For many people, the idea that I'm supposed to be bearing witness in my deeds and in my words to Christ has some terrifying components, and there are some common objections to it. As humans, we tend to say, look, I don't want to be responsible for the outcome. Like, I, I don't know if I can convince people to become Christians. I, I don't know if I can even convince people to come to church. But you're not responsible for the outcomes, right? God chose you. God's going to do the choosing in terms of the people you're talking to. At the end of the day, God's doing the choosing. All you have to do is say what you know. Some people shy away from evangelism, from testifying, witnessing to Christ in their lives because they go, what I was talking about earlier, boy, I'm a bad example, you know. I figure if I tell people I'm a Christian, I'll probably do the Christian cause more harm than good because I'm not good enough yet as a Christian to be out there a bearing witness. But again, God chose us not because of who we are, but despite who we are. We've said, <clears throat> many people have said, I don't know what to say. I mean, what do you say to somebody in terms of sharing your faith in Christ and witnessing to Christ the liver, risen Lord? I, I don't know what to say. But it's important to understand the concept of a witness. A witness isn't somebody who makes a persuasive argument. A witness is somebody who has experienced something and shares what they know from their own experience. They tell what they have seen and what they have heard and what they've experienced. Look, if you haven't encountered the risen Lord, if you've never met him, you're off the hook as far as evangelism goes because you don't actually have anything to witness to. But if at some time during your life you have encountered Christ, you have met the risen Lord, you have known the presence of Christ alive in the world and in your life, if you have experienced that, that's what you say to people. That's what you bear witness to. Let me wrap this up. I, I continue to find amazing little bits in the scriptures. And this passage we read this morning is no, um, is no exception to that. It begins with that lovely line where Peter talks to Cornelius. Cornelius tells him about this vision that he had from God in which he was told to send and get Peter over there. Peter arrives and Peter says, Wow, I now realize... I now realize. Let me just read that line for you. Right? Peter says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. This is the apostle Peter. This guy was there for the entire ministry of Christ. He was there at the ascension. He was there on the night Jesus was betrayed. He was there at the crucifixion. He was there at the resurrection. He's been there. He was there at Pentecost. He's been there for all of these key parts. He's a key leader in the church. And what Peter says is, I get it. I now realize. Even for Peter... He wasn't sure about this. Go on to Cornelius' place. He went because he was obedient to the vision that he'd been given, but he was pretty darned unsure about what he was going to encounter there, what he was going to see. And once he meets Cornelius and realizes what's going on, he says, oh, I now realize how true it is that God is in charge. And I think that that's there for us too. Our job is to bear witness. It's what we've been chosen for. It's our task, King's Way, for the new year that's starting up, the new year ahead. We've only actually really got one job to do, and that is to bear witness, to tell people what we know, to make disciples of all nations. And God has this promise for us, that if we do that, we will see him already at work in the place we were a little bit afraid to go.
And like Peter, we will have an opportunity, no matter how far along we are in our faith, to come to a moment of saying, I now realize how true it is that God is in charge. Amen.